Well, I suppose we will continue to look back at Made in Alabama uh, for years to come. And I remember at the time of the exhibition, Briding said, we're going to have not a catalog, but a book. She said, because the book will last. And one of the speakers referenced the point this morning that um, how important having a catalog is for an exhibition. And certainly this book on uh, native baskets in the collection of Lauren Rogers is a great tome, and we should be all very proud to have that in our collection. In Maiden, Alabama, there are many images, uh, and they're images of objects, but they're images of people. And one of those is this intriguing daguerreotype of the subject of our next talk. And when I saw that talk, I mean, saw that image, I wanted to know more. And I have looked forward to this day to hear Dr. Richard Bailey talk about Horace King and to give this personal salute to um, a an antebellum Alabamian that I think has a legacy as rich as any. And what better person to do that than a native Alabamian? You can read about Dr. Bailey's accomplishments, but I can tell you just from talking with him, I know that one thing where he takes great pride is that he is at home. He is a Montgomerian. Will you join me as we welcome Dr. Richard Bailey. Thank you very much for that simply wonderful introduction. It is indeed a pleasure for me to appear here this afternoon to talk about Horace King and one of the things I like about the introduction is that we might say a couple of personal statements regarding our good friend Horace King. In December 2020, the state of Alabama concluded its celebration of the state's bicentennial. Alabama entered statehood on December 14, 1819, making it the nation's 22nd state. I am uncertain how many times the name Horace King appeared in these discussions, but today I want to accentuate his role in Alabama history and in the history of the South. Horace King, as you can see, thank you, was born on September 8, 1807. He died May 28, 1885, and he was born in the Sherrod District, Chesterfield County, South Carolina, and he is buried today in LaGrange, Georgia. significant but little-known personalities of the 19th century. He was born in 1807 in the Sherrod District of South Carolina. I was born in South Carolina, a slave, the property of Edward King. He died and his kin sold me to Jeremiah Dunlop of Sherrod. He sold me to John Godwin. I learned the trade of bridge building. Horace King. John Goblin was King Sr. by maybe nine years, so you can see they were fairly close in age. He was self-taught engineer and architect. He was raised at the knee of his old Indian mother in South Carolina and showed promise. We know that his mother was a woman named Susan 
some, uh, most often called Lucky, who was, for all of her life after she came to Georgia, was either owned by John Godwin or after the Civil War, she lived with her daughter Clarissa, who had been owned by John Godwin. We, we can deal with, with this woman Lucky. We are told by the, uh, by the oldest record that touches on this, that's Cherry's history of Opelika, we're told that Horace's father was a half-breed Indian named Edmund King. But there is no Edmund King on the scene at any time. He disappears. He's simply a name. And Chester Remember that in the 1800s, one did not go to school to become an architect. One simply studied with someone who was an architect, and after that person had undergone so much training, this was part of an apprentice program, that person became certified to do whatever it was, be it building bridges or building homes or whatever the case may be. And this is what happened. Let's talk about Horace King for just one minute. And one of the things we want to emphasize is that we're talking about the 1820s and 1830s, in fact, antebellum Southern history. He's born on a plantation in the Sherrod district. And for the first, shall we say, 15, 18 years of his life, he's working around that plantation. But there's something happened in Connecticut in 1820 that would change Horry King's life. If your town invented what we today call the Lattice Truss, that was a new way of bridge building, which he used to truss to create support for wide spaces. In 1824, If your Towns was invited to the Sherrod District to construct a bridge over the PD River. It just so happens that Horace King was there and John Godwin was there. And we can imagine that they might have eyed each other, but a couple years later, John Godwin purchased Horace King. And Horace King became the property of this man and the lives of each one of these individuals would change forever. In 1832, John Godwin answered the call for someone to come to Columbus, Georgia to build a bridge connecting not only Columbus, Georgia and Phoenix City, but collecting, connecting Georgia and Alabama. And one of the things I have noticed in discussing this point, and by the way, if you have any questions as I talk, please raise your hand or say something and I'll pause and deal with your question. One of the things that few historians have really put a pen in is simply this. When Horace King and John Godwin constructed that bridge connecting Columbus, Georgia with Gerard as Phoenix City was called at that time, those two guys set into motion a series of events that would change this nation, particularly the South, for all times. Number one, many people use that Dillingham Street Bridge that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes as a way of moving westward. So you can imagine the kind of traffic that flowed th through Columbus, Georgia. And when they built that bridge in 1832, that was the only bridge within 100 miles north of Columbus, Georgia, or within 100 miles south of Columbus, Georgia. So in saying that, Columbus, Georgia becomes a mecca for traffic, a mecca for interest in people who wanted to move west. Paradoxically, it was the Dillon Street Bridge area where the last 
battle of the Civil War was fought. And just imagine how paradoxical it sounds that an enslaved individual would build a bridge that became prominent in the slave trading traffic and at the same time would be the site of the last battle of the Civil War. This is a picture showing what that lattice trust looked like. I've been surprised how many people did not know what a lattice trust was when it's so prevalent today when you go into the hardware store you can see samples of that lattice trust design but this is that lattice trust bridge that Horace King and John Godwin did early in their careers John Godwin was the supervisor and Horace King was the student as time went by, those roles, in a sense, reversed. Horace King, John Godwin noticed, learned quickly. So Horace King became a supervisor himself. And in becoming a supervisor, he also supervised other enslaved individuals. John Godwin responded to a, a bid in the newspaper to come to Alabama and build bridges. To the good fortune of the people of Alabama, he brought with him Horace King. And the history of bridge building in the state of Alabama and the state of Georgia has never been the same. They built the first bridge connecting Phoenix City or Gerard, as it was called at the time, to Columbus, Georgia. I'm always impressed by the scale scale of the undertaking that Horace that Horace must have done in 1832. He was here, hand tools, mules, 560 foot bridge to construct. That would, uh, he was a young man, he was in his 20s, a bridge that would support the kind of traffic that, that we have today. Now he had worked apparently in 1823, about eight years before, he had worked with Ithiel Town, the inventor of a marvelous new invention, the Town Lattice Bridge. It consisted of uh, a lattice, seemingly fragile, lattice truss along either side of the bridge. You've all seen this if you've seen covered bridges in the South. In 1820, it was a new invention. Horace was involved in this 440-foot bridge in 1823, and then finally, 32, the young man came into his own here and built the bridge that first tied Alabama and Georgia together across the Chattahoochee River and created that entity that is still a coherent area today called the Chattahoochee Valley. This is another picture of the Dillingham Street Bridge as is called uh, in Columbus, Georgia. Horace King and John Godwin built their reputations on the quality of their work. When John Godwin constructed a bridge, that bridge came with a five-year guarantee against flooding. If anything happened to that bridge, John Godwin would go back and he would actually construct that bridge again at no cost. So you can see what this meant for the people when they knew that the contractors would replace that bridge. And I just want to add that some of the bridges, the early bridges that Horace King and John Gottman built, be it a bridge at West Point, a bridge at Eufaula, or a bridge at Florence, those bridges cost in the area of $22,000, and they were financed by private investors. So you can see their work did not come cheap. In fact, Horace King and John Godwin made such a name for themselves that this is a $2 bill and it shows the Bank of Columbus and a picture of the Dillingham Street Bridge on it. That's how prominent they were in their day. Let's go back in time. This is big. It's, it's a clear indication of the esteem 
in which those two guys were held. Horace King was held in such high esteem that in 1837, John Godwin said to himself, I need to ensure that any creditor who comes to me is not able to take away Horace King as a way of paying a debt that I might owe. So what did John Godwin do? He deeded Horace King to Ann Godwin and her family who lived here in Montgomery. Now, let's go back for just one minute. John Godwin was concerned about keeping Horace King in the fold. But at the same time, think of just how much money he could have gotten had he just simply sold Horace King. He refused to do so because of the bond that existed between Horace King and John Godwin. So what did John Godwin finally decide to do? He decided to emancipate Horace King. Now let me go back again and emphasize something. In 1831, the Nat Turner Revolt took place in Southampton County, Virginia. That had a significant impact on manumissions in the state of Alabama. Whereas it might have been slightly easy for an enslaved person to have been manumitted before 1831, once the Nat Turner Revolt took place, it became extremely difficult for an enslaved person in the state of Alabama to secure his freedom. So you can then see what John Godwin was working against. That tide that was flowing throughout the South opposed to manumission. But Horace King had come into contact with Robert Jemison. He had built bridges for and done other work for Robert Jemison. Robert Jemison was chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Robert Jemison was a major slaveholder, owning as many as 500 slaves. He was from Tuscaloosa. So what John Godwin decided to do was to get with Robert Jemison and encourage him to steer through the Alabama House a bill to emancipate Horace King. Here's a copy of the act to emancipate Horace King. I think you can see it, but I want to read it nevertheless. An act to emancipate Horace King that said Horace King is hereby declared to be free and his emancipation is hereby confirmed and that the said Horace King shall not be required to leave the state of Alabama upon condition that the said John Godwin and H. Godwin and William H. Wright or any of one of them shall enter into bond with approved security to the judge of the county court of Russell in the sworn sum of $1,000 conditioned that the said Horace King shall never become a charge to the state or any county or town therein approved 2nd February 1846. Now let's tell the rest of the story, ladies and gentlemen. This is only part of it. The rest of the story is that John Godwin was so interested in ensuring that Horace King was emancipated, he sent Horace King to Ohio to be emancipated. Because at the time, the conditions in this country were operating under the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793. 
So Horace King had to go to Ohio to get emancipated and then come back to Alabama to be emancipated once again. For him to be truly and completely emancipated. Now think in terms of John Godwin going through those kind of expenses to ensure that Horace King would be in fact emancipated. But still that's only part of the story. The rest of the story is that when in 1878, as you see at the very bottom here, Horace King let it be known that while John Godwin and Robert Jemison were able to help orchestrate his manumission, he actually paid to be manumitted. Now this is part of the story that seldom comes out that Horace King in fact paid for his manumission. But the point of the matter is simply this. John Godwin did not have to emancipate Horace King. He had two options that I mentioned before. He could have sold him or he could have allowed his creditors to take him. They, had to, they come to him for that. But John Godwin, because of that bond that existed between those two fellows, he decided that he would emancipate Horace King instead of selling him or any other options that he might have. And at the same time, Robert Jemison had taken a liking to Horace King. I want to read this quote to you from Robert Jemison. He said, speaking of Horace King, he has worked for me in bond and free. I have never dealt or settled with a more correct or honest man of any color. Now when you think in terms of the 1840s and someone saying that about a black person, especially a person of the caliber of Robert Jemison who owned those 500 plus slaves. He didn't have to make that statement. He was under no kind of duress whatsoever to make such a statement. And then in 1859, when John Godwin dies, what does Horace King do? Horace King paid for John Godwin's burial expenses. And he went a step further. He put this headstone at John Godwin's grave. Now that headstone is still there in Phoenix City, Alabama. And I want to read that one for you also. John Godwin, born October 7, 1798, died February 26, 1859. This stone was placed here by Horace King in last remembrance of the love and gratitude he felt for his lost friend and former master. Now, many persons have misinterpreted what Horace King was trying to do. He was under no duress. He was under no illusions. The relationship between Horace King and John Godwin was sincere. And Horace King went a step further. He later made John Godwin's children his wars to ensure that those children were taken care of. And many persons have misinterpreted all of what is being said about Horace King. This is a picture of one of his bridges that span the Chattahoochee at Eufaula. And this is the Flint River Bridge that Horace King built. When he built this bridge, or right before he built this bridge, he had been working on a bridge in Milledgeville. And I think most of us know that at one point Milledgeville was the capital of Georgia. But Horace King encountered some difficulties in his negotiation in terms of getting that bridge completed. So Horace King picked up all of his work and shipped that work from Milledgeville 
to the Flint River area, and that's in the area of uh, Albany. And what he did in doing that, that became the first example in all of the South of a person constructing a bridge using prefabricated material. Now, many people know that for a while anyway, you could go into a mail order catalog and order this and when it arrives, you put it together. But that's what Horace King did in constructing the Flint River Bridge. It had never been done before. Now just think of the ingenuity, the imagination this man had in shipping all of his supplies by train from Milledgeville to Albany, Georgia. This is the bridge at Wetumpka, not too far from here, that he built in 1847. This is that same Wetumpka Bridge in the 1880s in the background. Now, I decided to just show you a sample of some of the works of Horace King. And one of the points I want to emphasize with this, Horace King was such a prominent personality that many chambers of commerce, many individuals would say that Horace King built this or built that or built that when in fact Horace King didn't. In other words, what is it, keeping up with the Joneses? Everybody want to lay claim to something that they could say that Horace King had touched. Now keep in mind, we're talking 19th century Alabama, and to a large extent, we're talking about antebellum Alabama. That a man could rise to this statue where everybody wanted to be associated with Horace King. Almost unbelievable. So these are just a few of the things that he did. He built the Muskogee County Courthouse in Columbus, Georgia. He built the Russell County Courthouse in Phoenix City. And at one time, a historian could say that nearly every house in Gerard had been built by Horace King or John Godwin. Dr. Bailey, who do you think made this staircase? Horace King. This is the first Presbyterian One church of the here in Montgomery. Best known architects, bridge builders of his day. Tell me a little bit more about his life. Well, first of all, he was born in the Sherrod district of South Carolina. He came to Alabama with his owner, John Goblin, in 1832. Um, they had received a contract to build a bridge to connect Gerard, which is now Phoenix City, Alabama, and Columbus, Georgia. And they did that in 1832. And uh, that work laid the foundation for their prominence and presence in this area, Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. You know, I've heard a lot about Horace King. What, what, what makes his story so remarkable? Well, there are so many aspects of his story that make history remarkable. Let's just name a few. First of all, he was the property of John Godwin. Basically, those two guys never arrayed themselves as master slave. They were only a few years difference in age and they arrayed themselves more as brothers than they did master slaves. And because of the skill, the aptitude, if you will, that Horace King displayed in engineering John Godwin sent him to school in Ohio so he could learn more, become better educated. And uh, Horace King returned to Alabama, built bridges, built homes, uh, you name it. He did. He rebuilt the Muscogee County Courthouse in 1840 in that's Columbus, Georgia, when it burned. And he built a staircase in the Capitol here in Montgomery when the Capitol burned. And he built so many bridges uh, that people have just marveled at how sturdy his bridges were. 
Why do you and other historians think that he may have made the staircases in the Presbyterian Church? First of all, the similarity and the fact that uh, this is Montgomery and he is uh, located in um, East Alabama, the Phoenix City, Columbus, Georgia area. But at the same time, he is one who was able to travel. Very few African Americans had the liberty of uh, almost traveling alone as Horace King and a couple of others did in antebellum Alabama. But the similarity of this staircase, and if we go in, uh, from where I'm standing, if we turn around and look at how it spirals, and that's the similarity that we have with the Capitol here in Montgomery. Um, this is just amazing how this stairwell, first of all, resembles the stairwell in the Capitol here in Montgomery and how sturdy it is and how long it has lasted. The trademark of Horace King's work. But if Horace King was good at building the Russell County Courthouse, the courthouse in Muskogee County, Columbus, Georgia, building all these homes, et cetera, et cetera. Once the Civil War breaks out, who do Confederate forces look to for assistance with construction? Only one man, Horace King. With Columbus, Georgia being a center of Confederate activity, Horace King was constricted to work with the uh, Confederate Navy, especially along the Apalachicola River. And what you have here, this is a telegram from one of Alabama's wartime governors, John Gill Shorter, to uh, J.F. Bozeman asking if Horace King is engaged in, you see the rest of it. He wanted Horace King to be involved and whatever advantage his work could lend to the Confederate cause. So Horace King responded to uh, John Gill Shorter. He did that and many people have said to readers that Horace King did this on his own free will. But during the Civil War, Horace King wrote Robert Jemison a letter and he asked him, say, what would happen if I didn't work for the Confederacy. And the thing is, we don't have any evidence of what that reply is. But we can say that Horace King uh, did work on such iron class as the Muskogee and a gunboat that was called the Jackson. Once the war was over, and even during the war, Horace King let it be known that he was working against his will, but he, he actually had no choice. But the point is, he wasn't the only African Americans who worked for the Confederacy. Conditions in Alabama that made it possible for Horace King to represent Russell County in the Alabama legislature beginning in 1868 were quite simple. First of all, the black and white citizens of Russell County had enormous respect for this man. Let's look at the black ones. They viewed him as a role model. They knew him well. Horace King had been in the area almost 30 years. In fact, about 35 years. So he was no stranger to these people. They trusted him. They saw him as an honest man. And then for the whites, they did not want a carpetbagger representing Russell County in the Alabama legislature. Horace King was a Mason. He had traveled freely across the state of Alabama, the state of Mississippi, the state of Georgia. He was a man who was known by persons like Robert Jemison of Tuscaloosa and Alabama's wartime governor, John Gill Shorter, who was governor of the state of Alabama from 1861 to 1863. Consequently, Horace King became the ideal individual to represent Russell County in the Alabama legislature. Horace King moved to LaGrange and at, uh... Okay, let's tell the rest of the story. When the Civil War ended, many people assumed that because Horace King had done all of his work for the Confederacy, that he would be a rich man. Theoretically, he was. It's just that Confederate money didn't have any value. <laughs> 
And let me tell you, the family held on to that Confederate currency until the 1920s, before they put it in the trash and actually threw it away. And I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I received a telephone call about three months ago. A gentleman asked me what happened to some of Horace King's wealth. I had never had a question like that before, and I assumed he was just a treasure seeker, so I told him, you need to ask somebody else that question, because I didn't even know uh, who the caller was, but for someone to call me and ask me of all questions about Horace King, what happened to his wealth? I wasn't going to ask that question for anybody, but it made Horace King change his motor of operation. When the Civil War ended, Horace King said, I will never accept any kind of currency from anybody. So from that point forward, he only accept silver coins, never any currency, because he had gone broke. But at the same time, once the Civil War was over, Horace King's fortunes turned around because, for one, he became a registrar in 1867 for Russell County. Then in 1868, he uh, became a member of the legislature representing Russell County. But the point is that he and his sons began to build bridges and everything else as never before. But he had learned his lessons about how to make money and he had taught his sons well about how to make money. It's just that on the personal side, Horace King's wife died. His first wife, Frances Gould Thomas, died in 1865. His wife was about 14 years his, uh, his junior when he married her, but the point is Horace King married well. She was a free African American, which means according to antebellum law in Alabama, the children took the status of the mother, which means that the five children who were born to Horace King and Francis were free because the mother was free. So once the Civil War was over, these kids had never known what enslavement was like because they had never been slaves. But uh, two years thereafter, Horace King married again. He married a lady named uh, Susan McManus Jones, but they had no children. But Horace King, first thing he did, and this is the kind of story that almost nobody wants to tell about Horace King, some of the things he did for the black community. We've talked about what he just did for the Confederacy. What did he do for the black community? In Coweta or Carroll County, Georgia, Horace King decided he wanted to set up a colony, in effect a school, where African-American men could learn trades and for African-American women to learn domestic skills. It didn't go that far, but still that's what he did. What many historians concentrate on is the fact that Horace King, as a representative from Russell County, was seldom present. Well, he was elected in 1868, didn't take his seat until November 1869, but when he was there, he cast votes 78 percent of the time. He introduced very few bills, but he did introduce one bill in his second term of office that started in 1870 that prohibited the use of alcohol in Hertzboro, Alabama. Now that's, that's, that's big, and it says something about what kind of person he was personally. After his term ended in 1872, Horace King moved to LaGrange, Georgia, and continued to build bridges and everything else with his sons. In 1875, again working with, for the black community, he was responsible for constructing LaGrange Academy, the first school for African Americans in LaGrange, Georgia. And he built Warren Chapel Methodist Church in LaGrange, which means that Horace King was a man who cared about all people. That's what we're talking about. And we've had that theme uh, mentioned here uh, earlier today. This is the kind of person that Horace King was. This is a, is a picture of an elderly uh, Horace King. These are a series of newspaper clippings to show some of the places I moved around the state and talking about uh, Horace King. And everywhere I went, people were fascinated 
with the stories about Horace King. Many people had never heard of Horace King, but they all left in awe of this person. This newspaper clipping is from the You Follow Times Tribune. When I went to You Follow, I spoke at the Carnegie Library, and those persons at the Carnegie Library knew a direct descendant of John Gill Shorter who lived in Florida and that lady came and attended that program and she thanked me profusely for what I had said about John Gill Shorter. In 2003, February, I was permitted to place a portrait of Horace King for one month in the lobby of the Capitol. The significance of this is simply that this marked the first time that a portrait of an African American had been placed on display in the lobby of the Capitol. The program was well received and I went and found a direct descendant of Horace King David King, and he came to Alabama, Montgomery, and spoke on behalf of Horace King. I had Professor Wayne Flint from Auburn to come as one of my speakers, Ed Harbison, Chairman of the Georgia Congressional Black Caucus, to come and speak, and Dr. Wiggins, uh, Sarah from University of Alabama, came and sat in the audience and wouldn't charge me a penny. A school teacher, Ernestine Shakur from Union Spring, Bullock County, brought her fourth grade class, and then Peterson Elementary School from right here in Montgomery, that entire class, fourth grade, came to that program. And Mary Ann Neely was there that day also to show her interest in uh, Alabama history. But this is a copy of the program, and I didn't want this program just to stay in my uh, desk drawer at the house. I wanted to share with everybody because this program marked the first time, as I said, that an African-American's portrait had been placed on display in the lobby of the Capitol. And you can see those kids from uh, Peterson Elementary School there now. Now, what happened was, about two months after February 2003, I just happened to have been in the Capitol, and the tour guys rushed up to me. I didn't know what was wrong. And they said, school kids were coming in droves looking for the portrait of Horace King. I made it my business to go back over to the Russell County Courthouse from where I had borrowed that portrait. And I asked could I borrow it again. And I went to Birmingham and made a copy of it. And over the next 14 years, I eventually got permission to place that portrait on permanent display in the state capitol here in Montgomery showing my appreciation for Horace King and now everybody in Alabama and everywhere who comes to Montgomery can show their appreciation to the man who built the staircase um, in the Capitol here in Montgomery. That was a big day. And I th thought then, if I think now, that we owe it to Horace King to give him that kind of salute because for many years, even for people who knew about it, nobody was talking about the fact that an African American had built that staircase in the state capitol. And I just want to applaud the Alabama Historical Commission for working with me to get that portrait on permanent display in the lobby of the state capitol. And to show you just how time moves forward, the next month, March 2017, I was invited to come to LaGrange, Georgia to speak for the rededication of the Mulberry Street Cemetery. All those historians need to hear this. For many years, the historians had written that Horace King had died in 1887. That information was based on a creditable source, a family Bible. And we all know usually when someone writes something in the family Bible, we can usually accept it as being the truth. But through further research, we learned that Horace King actually died 
in 1885 instead of 1887. So when we rededicated that uh, cemetery, Mulberry Street Cemetery in LaGrange, we made certain that on Horace King headstone, we had his actual death date, his accurate death date. And that was a big day. It rained a little bit that day, but through it all, it seemed as if the sun was shining on a person who had uh, given so much. This is a historic marker that's on the, uh, the streets in uh, LaGrange. That's a picture taken again of that uh, cemetery. Horace King was inducted to the Alabama Men's Hall of Fame in 2017, later that same year. And um, he was inducted to the Georgia uh, Hall of Fame. And this is a statement that was issued by the Alabama Men's Hall of Fame. And we just want to show you the first Hall of Fame, I believe, that Horace King was inducted into, and that was right here in the state of Alabama at the University of Alabama when he was inducted into the Alabama Engineering Hall of Fame. Yes. I think my greatest appreciation of my great-grandfather came when he was inducted into the Engineers Hall of Fame. I was fortunate enough to be invited to the University of Alabama, the Tuscaloosa campus, uh, to accompany my father uh, when he received an award for Horace King. Uh, he was inducted into the Alabama Engineering Hall of Fame. And we attended the ceremonies. And at that point, I realized, oh my goodness, this man was a great man. And I didn't even know it. On behalf of my great-grandfather, Horace King, I am proud to accept this award. Horace King is simply a sort of a miracle. One man in a million, and as such, a sort of example of what each of us, if we can become the one in a million, could possibly become. William H. Green, that's his name. So that bright young man stand. And we just want to close out with a quote by William H. Green. Horace King was a Southern everyman, born a slave but winning his freedom, sprang from the three noble races of the early South, laborer and legislator. His life was an astonishing symbolic bridge, a bridge not only between states but between men. Like one of his stateless lattice trucks bridges, Horace King's life soared above the murky waters of historical limitations of human bondage and racial prejudice. He did not change the current of social history, but he did transcend them and stands as a reminder of our common humanity, the potential of human spirit, the power of mutual respect. Ladies and gentlemen, today we salute Horace King. Question. Yes. That's that's one of the questions, ma'am, that many people have asked. Um, several reasons, but nothing you can just really put a pin in and say this is the reason that he relocated. We know he left the legislature after having served two terms, and I think everybody knows in those years a legislative term was two years, so two terms would have been four years. But in terms of saying this is the reason, I can't do that. But we can say that uh, when he went to LaGrange, he was wildly accepted, and uh, he did everything. In fact, he basically turned his bridge-building enterprise over to his sons. And uh, he went and started building uh, schools and churches, et cetera. And, and I just, I just want to say, in closing out about Horace King, Lafayette Square, on the day of his uh, funeral, when that procession moved through um, the square in, La in uh, LaGrange, people came out of their stores and they had their hands over their hearts and they stood there in, in silence reverence to Horace King. Now for 1885, that's about as close as an African-American probably has ever received in the state of Alabama up to that time. 
that kind of what we might call a state funeral. But if you're talking about people who appreciate Horace King, I'm jealous, actually. When I go to Horace, uh, LaGrange, really, I'm serious. I'm jealous how people in LaGrange just woo, to, even to this day, over Horace King with that historic marker, with a street being named for him and all of that. And then when you come to Montgomery for all that he did, in addition to having relatives here, and we don't have anything named for Horace King. I'm not throwing out any hints either, don't get me wrong. But I'm saying I, I do feel a little awkward when I go to LaGrange and I'm talking about Horace King and I'm looking around and I'm seeing all of these things that are named for him there. But he was wildly accepted in LaGrange, Georgia. Question? Oh, I thought I see somebody's hand. Yes, yes. LaGrange Academy? Yes. LaGrange Academy? Yes. I do not. I do not. He asked me did I know how many students enrolled at LaGrange Academy. I do not know the number. Yes. I just know it was the first black school in LaGrange, eighteen seventy around eighteen seventy five. Yes. Okay, yes, ma'am. Did you say that the school in Korea County did not get off ground, or did? Did I say he did what? The school that you said that he wanted to start, or he started in. It did not. Did not. Did not. Did not. It was. It was. It was a, a colony, as the historians call it, in um, Coweta or Carroll County, Georgia. It did not get off the ground. It did have the blessings of the Freedmen's Bureau. But um, it, it didn't get off the ground. And, and this is right after the uh, Civil War time, but it, but it didn't, unfortunately, it did not get off the ground. Mm -hmm. 